animal movement. So animal movement also varies by species. Like animal ID, animal movement is really driven federally, but in Alberta, we've had a very strong presence working with animal movement for about the past, I think 15 years, is safe to say their database has got data that far back. Our primary industry organization we work with is Livestock Identification Services, LIS. So they have a delegated authority responsibility for beef, dairy, horses, and sheep. And then Alberta Pork will work with the other ones. This is a tracking from premises to premises. You'll notice he's driving cattle. There are rules associated with if you're driving them on foot and how far you go in Alberta and whether or not you need to complete a manifest versus if you just get them on the truck every time. So it's important for people to know those rules and for producers and they should just contact mm -hmm. LAS. You can always come see me at the booth because we've been partnering with them for a lot of years. So savvy on the basics. This is important. An average cow, this is based on data from LAS, will move 4.5 times in their lifetime. When I started out, I said a lot of producers don't realize that they're, they're raising food, right? In about four and a half movements, that animal is on someone's kitchen table or in a freezer somewhere. Imagine trying to trace back that movement if you don't know where they've been, if you're trying to deal with the disease. LAS in 2015 inspected over 4 million head of cattle that's just at inspection sites. That's not the sites that move privately. That's not to clinics. That's not to fairgrounds often. That's not the classic inspection. No. They should be reporting or they should be inspecting more, but people are forgetting to invite them, and that's why we're saying invite them out. They also inspect over 55 head of cattle. They will inspect animals when they're moving within the province for certain things, and always when you leave the province, you need a permit. If you're going to Saskatchewan, BC, the territories or the states or further. So very important. I like this, I like this map, but it's a little hard to see. This would be the Grand Prairie auction market. So let's say this animal came from that would be north of high level down to GPR. And let's say there's ten of them. They come into the Grand Prairie auction market. So they there's one in Grand Prairie market that's No, there, there isn't. But that's from when this was there. So this is where they fan out. Look at how far they go in two movements, right down to the states in some cases. Gone. In other cases, they go to some sort of backgrounding facility or somewhere where they're being assembled until they get enough of the same weight, and then they move them again. So they can travel really far, really quickly. And if we don't know where they came from, where they're going, it's very hard to do any sort of trace back. Okay, so my first question, you mentioned Jersey. Are you talking about a... Beef or dairy? Okay. So every. No, that's okay. We'll deal with both. Um, so dairy has something called ProAction, which is being supported by Dairy Farmers of Canada. It is an industry standard. It's not regulations, but it rolls up industry st or regulations into the industry standards. They are encouraging every dairy operation to read in. So you sell an animal to me, I read in. It's now part of my inventory. It shows up in my account on the CLTS. I then sell it to the abattoir. They read it in, it shows up on their account. So let's say it's not dairy and it's beef or something. We are similarly encouraging every producer to be proactive and do it. They do not have to do it, but we encourage them to. So what you've just talked about starts to get into where it gets challenging when we're doing tracebacks because now we have to start requesting bills of sale from the abattoir. We have to stop at that second farmer get his bill of sale, and then go to you. You will show up in the system, so we'll contact you, but there might be four sales between you and the abattoir. So that's where the more enhanced the system is, the more people step up and complete the paperwork and do their job, it's a much stronger system. Great question, thank you. What you could do is you would do a readout, showing that those animals with those RFID tags are no longer in your inventory and then encourage the other producer to do a read-in. Yeah, and then you'll get them. Pardon me? If you don't have a scanner. Then you go to your local Alberta Agriculture Office and borrow one for free. Right. <laughs> or you monitor our Growing Forward programs and see when they reopen with money and apply. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the person. 
And your third option, call your local mobile field vet. If you've got a lot of animals, they will come out. That's why they're there. Yes, sir. Why aren't RSID tags going up on aftermarket cages? That is where the regulation I mentioned earlier, where they're starting to change it. You now have to provide a premise ID to show them. The, R, uh, the RFID tag component, some of them are saying it's too much information on one document, so they're scanning it in. But what we're going to be doing... Great question, though. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. So good segue. Someone was talking about we have to go to paperwork, and I said we have to rely on your papers. Livestock manifests that are the Alberta Livestock Manifest should be retained for 10 years. 10 years, because the life cycle of the animals that use that manifest or that they use that manifest for, it's appropriate. And I'm going to give you a really good example as to why that's so appropriate moving forward. The manifest needs to be filled out completely. On a livestock manifest, under the regulations for that manifest, every box, every section needs to be completed in order for it to be filled out completely, including trailer numbers, which those of you that are familiar with biosecurity and some of the other things out there will understand why it's important to know maybe which trailer certain animals that may have certain diseases were transported in. Includes a description of the livestock, which some people will actually make their RFID tag number. You've had some people, they'll print out their birth certificates with the RFID tag numbers from the CLTS, and they'll say, these are the animals we're sending to the auction market, and they'll attach that birth certificate to the paperwork at the auction market, and we will then use that information in a traceback. Some people will attach it to the manifest as well, which kind of addresses your issue, sir, but it comes back to what I was saying to this lady. It's a gap, and we have to go to the paper. It's not fully electronic, and when time is of the essence, it's really a pain, <laughs> and it can cause other problems like Japan shutting their door for maybe a week longer than they needed to. And as I've already mentioned, retain the manifest, but also retain copies of the bill of sale. A lot of producers don't think about that for whatever reason. Encourage me to retain copies of the bill of sale. Real quick segue on this. Um, when that first BSC case that had so much hype in 2003 happened, at one point there was a media scrum where a whole bunch of media came in and they were grilling the producer, a retired dairy producer, about you know, how did this happen in his farm and a whole bunch of things as part of the traceback. And they were very harsh on him, very harsh. And he was standing at the front with our minister and our deputy minister and I think our assistant deputy minister. And I was at the back and I was told, take notes, pay attention to what's happening, you know, and, and also pay attention to which questions are being asked by who in case there's a problem because we need to fix that media <laughs> issue later, right? So I was paying very close attention, and one gentleman asked a question, and he was very pointed, and almost to the point where I would say belligerent and rude. And this dairy farmer, when he came in, was not wearing anything fancy. He was wearing older jeans, an older work shirt. He had, like, the, the train track style hat, right? And he was getting hammered. And you know what he did? He said, just a minute. And he pointed at this one media journalist, turned around, grabbed an archive file box, put it on the table beside him, and, he s and the communications person at the same time said to the media person, I think your questions are getting a little bit out of line. And the producer said, no, it's okay. What's your question? And the guy said, why did you feed that? And where did it go? And this gentleman ripped his pulled a file out and said, on this date, I opened up a bag of feed that I bought from this location, I fed it to this pen and this pen, it lasted for this many days. And then he sh put that one away and he said, and by the way, these are the animals that were in those pens. Shut the media down. In my opinion, my personal opinion, he was the best advocate for our industry that we could have ever asked for. It wasn't high tech, he wasn't slick, he was genuine, he was honest, he cared about his business, he had integrity, and he was organized, and he shut them down. And I personally believe that's part of the reason why there's so much confidence in what we do during that incident, right? If you can see someone with that much integrity, and that's what we need to teach our producers and what we need them to aspire to, and we need to lead the way. Alberta Pork also has their own manifest. They keep track of some of the same information. 
main exceptional differences are the receiver submits it, not the producer, <coughs> and they keep theirs on file for five years because of their production cycle. Best practices, again, remind them to complete that manifest. You know, they don't have to complete a manifest to go to a vet clinic, but it sure is a good business practice to know which animals you moved which day. And at the risk of putting LIS into bankruptcy, they're free. Like, <laughs> they're free. So it gives them a good record. What legally Invite, right? not when they go to a vet clinic. Well, no, if you go, to, let's say I'm transporting to your clinic mm -hmm. and I'm taking my animal directly back to where I originally brought it from, yeah. I don't have to complete a manifest. Okay. If I'm going to your clinic and then I've decided to take them to a community pasture or to Phil's feeders, yeah. I have to complete a manifest. That's for cattle. For horses, it's only for sale or slaughter, but that includes private sales, folks. If I'm selling directly to Phil a couple of horses because he's decided he needs glorified lawnmowers, I have to complete a manifest. Also invite local livestock inspectors out to inspect the animals. There is a reason why they inspect them. We need that documentation. Every inspection they do ends up in their database, which helps us with the tracebacks, which we're going to talk about more in terms of getting away from the paper. And retain a copy as the destination. There's four or five copies in those manifests, folks. Be familiar with it. Know which one you can keep for your own records. Protect yourself. Yes, sir? Do the inspectors actually read the tags, or do they just check the brands? At this point in time, they are not reading tags. They're checking for brands and for gender and for color. Uh, we've done some trials a while ago about them reading the tags and it was just too much for one or two people to do. So we're playing around with how that might work. Mm -hmm. 